consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout. Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. everybody to the midweek message of Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. My name is Brian Ross. I'm the pastor of Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We're glad that you've chosen to uh, tune in with us this evening. Uh, this evening we're going to be continuing uh, a series, a midweek series that I started last week uh, on the issue of um, the weapons of our warfare. So if you would open to 2 Corinthians 10. And uh, while you turn there, just a, a couple a couple updates. Uh, first thing is, uh, we're aware of the fact that our recording and our live stream from Sunday had terrible audio on it. And I've listened back to it and I've basically made the decision that it was so bad. And I actually had a brother, Reed, uh, help me try to recover it. And we just weren't able to do it. And so uh, we've kind of made the decision to just mark that video private and move on. At some point, maybe I'll reteach it. Um, maybe in a different format, but I don't have any plans on doing that in the near future. So I plan on moving ahead next Sunday in our study of the book of Colossians and not uh, redoing what I already did. So um, just uh, if you would be aware of that. 
Um, other than that, we're glad you're here and I want to get right into the study. So last week I began looking at the issue of the weapons of our warfare. So let's read a few verses here in 2 Corinthians uh, and then we'll have a word of prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have this evening, yeah, even th remotely through technology, to connect with uh, uh, fellow saints, both from our assembly here in Michigan and also around the world. We're grateful for that. We pray that the, the study this evening would be edifying and encouraging. We're grateful for the time we could spend together in your word. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> so last Sunday we spent a lot of time sort of setting the table for this, uh, looking at some preliminary things, some introduction. This, this is maybe part two of an introduction. It's probably the um, uh, best way of looking at it. We're not really going to get into a, dis a discussion yet of the exact weapons. We're sort of still kind of laying some preliminary things and some framework to think about this issue with respect to. But last time we spent a lot of time looking at verse 2, where Paul says, But I beseech you that I may not, sorry, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So we, we talked about how when Paul, there were some in Corinth who were accusing Paul of walking according to the flesh. I believe that's on account of the nature of the first epistle that he sent them, uh, 1 Corinthians, which you have in your Bible. Okay, And so a lot of people are, are Paul was upset with them, right? He was really kind of taking them to task for a lot of the things that they were doing and or, or not doing in some cases as far as their behavior and conduct goes, really reproving them there in 1 Corinthians. So some people were accusing him of walking according to the flesh. And then we see there in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So I try to explain the idea that um, until the day of redemption, all of us, saved people, are in the flesh in the sense that we inhabit a body of flesh. Now, we have spiritually, by the circumcision made without hands, been cut away from that. Our soul and our spirit have been cut away from that, right? So that sin that resides in our flesh doesn't have to have dominion over us anymore, and our old man is crucified and dead. And I, I tried to explain that. So what he's talking about there in verse 3 is the fact that as long as you're on planet Earth, as long as you're in this Earth suit, if you will, you're in the flesh in that sense. Now that doesn't mean, but we should not walk according to the flesh or walk after the flesh. Verse, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So the warfare that we're involved in currently as believers, while we currently reside in a human body of flesh until the day of redemption, we are not warring after the flesh. And so I tried to, to, to make that clear, right? Then we also looked at, last time, all of the warfare terminology the military terminology that Paul uses throughout his epistles to describe things as it relates to believers. And so we looked at a lot of different things related to that, about no man that warreth entangleth. We talked about the weapons of our warfare and standing and, and, and a lot of things. I, I don't want to go into all of those things again, because if I do that, we won't get anywhere this evening. Okay. So we looked at the idea of Satan taking and getting an advantage over us by his devices in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And so we, we looked at some of those things just in sort of a preliminary way. And so what I want to start to do this evening is try to build on that, okay? So let's go to verse 4. Look at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So notice that verse, it says... For the weapons of our warfare, the 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 word weapons is uh, the, the the word there. The underlying word appears six times in five verses in a King James Bible, and there's a lot of things that it discusses if you look at, if you study this word. So hold your hand there quickly and come over to John 18. Come over to John chapter 18. Yes, um, there's there's physical weapons. The word is used to describe obviously physical weapons. You can see that. Uh, come over to John 18. I, you, you're well aware of the fact there's physical weapons mentioned in the Scripture. Look at John 18, 
look at verse 1. John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples uh, over the brook Kedron, uh, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches, and there it is, weapons. So when Judas brings this gang of thugs to arrest Jesus here, is what kind of weapons do they have? Well, they obviously have physical weapons, right? They have torches, they have, they have swords, they have spears probably, armor, physical armor, etc. So they come with physical weapons. So sometimes the word is used to describe um, physical weapons. But it's also used uh, to describe spiritual uh, armor and spiritual weapons. Come over to Romans 13. Come with me to Romans 13. And let's look at verse 12. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. So Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. When he's talking about weapons, sometimes that word is used to describe literal physical weapons. And other times it's used to describe spiritual weapons. Now, if physical weapons are real, the non-physical weapons or the spiritual weapons or the weapons of our warfare that aren't carnal, that aren't fleshly, that aren't physical, those would also be real. And this that word is used in other places here. Let's look at verse Romans 13, let's look at verse 12. He says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and now notice it, and let us put on the armor of light. That word, that phrase armor of light is a translation of the same word. Now when he says put on the armor of light, he's not talking about you going up and picking a physical sword up, or grabbing your gun, or some other type of physical weapon. It's a spiritual armor. It's the armor, it's, it's, it's the armor light it's it's the armor of god let's come over to second corinthians chapter six come over to second corinthians chapter six but we need to see that the bible is using this these words different ways to describe different things and just as the weapons that judas and his gang of thugs brought were real and they actually had physical weapons there's also spiritual weapons there's non-carnal weapons that are just as real as those physical ones. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse seven. It says, uh, "By the word of truth, by the power of God." Here it is: "By the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left." So those are all referring to that. Or they're all those are all translations of that same word that's translated weapons. So you have the armor of light. You have the armor of righteousness. You have the physical weapons. So what, what I want you to notice from that then is that we need to notice um, notice that we need weapons. Come with me back to 2 Corinthians 10. We need weapons because we are engaged in warfare. If you're not engaged in warfare, um, you know, you, you maybe have a rifle or weapons for hunting and fishing and, you know, skinning your whatever it is you can, kind of a thing, right? But... Weapons, in the sense that this word is referring to, is talking about weapons of war, weapons that you would use, you know, dur during battle, during war. And we need weapons because we're engaged in warfare. So think about it this way prior to going into battle, soldiers are extensively trained in how to care for and utilize their weapons. My master's degree is in military history, so I've done a lot of uh, reading and research about things on this particular subject matter and the soldier's relationship to his weapons be it in the ancient world with when they're fighting with spears and swords and armor and, and all that sort of thing in the ancient world or be it in the more modern world um, they had to be intimately aware of their weapons and, and how they worked and they took great care for those things because they relied upon them when they would enter into battle so the reason that we need weapons is because we are engaged in warfare. And we don't want to be spiritually a casualty of war. Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So 
We're engaged in a warfare. Hold your hand there and come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and look at... So the reason we have weapons and armor is because there's a war. There's a war that we're engaged in as believers, and we need to be properly equipped. So in order for us to enter into a... In order for us, while we're in the flesh, until the day of redemption, that is... Your soul and your spirit are still residing in a fleshly body until the day of redemption. While we're in the flesh, we're not fighting. We're not warring after the flesh, and there's weapons that are not carnal. So we need to know about that, right? And the reason there's weapons is because we're in a warfare. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Paul says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So, you can war a good warfare, you can war a bad warfare, um, but you got to know what the weapons are because we're involved in this in this war. So the, the, the idea of war there, here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, is the idea of military service. It's the idea of military life, the life of a soldier, the life of a warrior, and the contest and the struggle with spiritual enemies. And so just like you have human soldiers that are engaged in human warfare and all that goes along with that, Paul's using this terminology to try to get across to us as believers that we're engaged in something similar when it comes to spiritual things. So come back to 2 Corinthians 10. Let's come back to 2 Corinthians 10. Now, the weapons are not... Notice what it says, 2 Corinthians 10. You continue. We'll go to Romans chapter 7. So, the weapons of this warfare, they're not carnal. They're not fleshly. We're not warring after the flesh. Romans 7, verse... 14, Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So when, he, when he's talking about that, he's talking about his, his flesh. The, he, the, um, the, even though Paul's a saved man, does he still have the ability to choose to walk in the, walk in the flesh and not after the Spirit? Yeah, well, that, that flesh is sold out to sin. That's all it knows how to do. Which is one reason why when you get saved and you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and your, your soul and your spirit are cut away from that body of death, you have now the ability to walk in newness of life, which you didn't have before you were saved. Romans 15. Come over to Romans 15. The, the idea of carnal and so forth is, is used all through you know, Paul's epistles to talk about fleshly things. Um, Romans 15 Verse 27, it says, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles, which have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So he's talking there about money, right? The offering for the poor saints that were in Macedonia, that there is that carnal, that carnality. Like, you go to work, you get paid. That's a carnal endeavor. Now, because you're saved, you can redeem that uh, activity and do all things to the glory of God, right? Um, you can do all things without murmurings and disputings because now, as, as a saved person, you have the ability to do that, which an unsaved person doesn't have. So come back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, all right? Now, why, why are they not carnal? The reason the weapons aren't carnal in verse 4 is because in verse 3 we don't war after the flesh. So you have to understand the connection between carnal and flesh, or carnality and somebody being fleshly, right? So if in verse 3 we don't war after the flesh, then it follows naturally that the weapons of our warfare wouldn't be fleshly or carnal. 
because that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're engaged in. We're not engaged in a carnal fleshly pursuit or war. We are engaged in a spiritual war, a war that is going to require non-carnal or not non-fleshly weapons. So the weapons of warfare are not carnal because we don't war after the flesh. And because we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Go back to Ephesians 6. So our warfare is not after the flesh, and we are not wrestling, we're not struggling, we're not in a contest or a warfare with flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So here is the point, okay? You cannot fight a spiritual enemy using a fleshly weapon. You cannot fight a, a, a spiritual enemy using a fleshly weapon. So if I go to the gun case and I get out my guns and I, I, I can't, they're useless in a wrestling match. They're useless in a struggle or a battle or a war against a spiritual enemy. So if we're going to fight the good fight of faith, we need to understand the nature of our weaponry and how it is designed to function in our lives as believers. So there's really some things here that we make sure that we understand all right now look at verse 11 there ephesians 6 verse 11 put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil so there's a lot to say about that verse so let's just kind of attack it a little bit at a time or piece by piece okay first we need to put on the whole armor of god so that look what it says um Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God in the intent that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So, a while. So, the reason we put on the armor of God is to stand or hold our ground against the wiles of the devil. So, a what's a while? Um, I remember growing up, Saturday morning cartoons and, uh, you know, Bugs Bunny. And you know how um, <coughs> Wiley Coyote always tried to trap the Roadrunner. He always tried to capture him and trap him, right? And he would he would try to devise some clever trick, some new scheme, um, some contraption or device that he would uh, lay some sort of a trap with uh, subtlety and subterfuge to try to capture the Roadrunner. You remember those those cartoons? Hopefully some of you do. Well, why is he called Wiley Coyote? He's called Wiley Coyote because he's trying to be Wiley. He's trying to sneakily ensnare and capture the Roadrunner. Well, what's this say? It says we may, we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. A wile is a cleverly designed trick or device which someone... Uh, with, um, Sorry, let me start over. A while is a cleverly designed trick or device by which someone deceives another. So it is a deceptive mechanism to deceive somebody, to ensnare somebody. It is cunningly produced with the goal of fooling someone. Fooling someone into accepting something that as into accepting something as true when in reality it's false. So, what is the devil doing? Okay, The devil is uh, coming against you, he's coming against me, through his wiles, through his cleverly designed tricks and devices, with the goal of fooling us into accepting things as true when they are in fact false or not true. So it's important to understand the nature of Satan's warfare against us is designed to deceive, beguile, trick, or fool us into accepting the truth of something which in reality is false. So, on the armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
So there's other terminology that Paul uses here about in, in his epistles here. Okay, come with me back to Galatians chapter three. Come with me back to Galatians chapter. Bewitched you. What does it mean to be bewitched? You know, there was a TV show by that name too, wasn't there? Okay. He says, Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes... See, there's a bewitching so that you're not going to obey the truth. There's a deception. There's a bewitching. There's a while that's designed to move you away from the truth and to accept something is true that's not really true. That's false. This is what Satan is constantly... This is what the devil is constantly trying to do. He is constantly trying to take you and move you off of the truth. And he's extremely sneaky. He is extremely wily in how he devises to do this. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Look at Colossians chapter 2. The enemy will use what appears to be the truth or what sounds like it might be true it may have the ring of truth but upon so that you will just accept it and when you accept it he moves you off of the ground that you're supposed to be standing on okay so there's the armor of God we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil the wiles of the devil again are those cleverly devised, devised tricks and schemes that are designed to fool you into accepting something that's true that's in fact false just like the Galatians did they, Paul says who's bewitched you that you should not obey the truth so when they left the truth when they failed to stand for the truth they were bewitched they were deceived Colossians chapter 2, how does, how does this happen? Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. See, here's the thing, right? If, if they weren't enticing words, they wouldn't fool anyone. And one of the things that I've noticed and that I've really come, come to believe is Satan is so wily and so tricky that even if you even if he can't keep you from getting into or from comprehending the truth of a position he will allow you to go to such an extreme understanding of that that or take up such an extreme position that you you he's really putting you out there on a limb where you're able to just sort of no one's going to pay attention to you because you're taking such an extreme view that it just doesn't even make any sense. And anybody who's looking at that or analyzing that view or reading it or understanding that view from the outside is going to be like, what is this? This doesn't make any sense, right? But how did he get, the, how did he get you there? He got you there through beguiling and enticing words. They sounded good. They sounded like they made sense. They sounded like they were a good idea. But they went too far. Enticing words. If they weren't enticing, you wouldn't listen. So, I see this. I see this with uh, you know, with, with my from my observation with with believers, right? Beguile you with enticing words. Look at Colossians chapter two, verse eight. Look at verse eight. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. So, what through his wiles and his beguiling and enticing words. What the devil is trying to do is, is spoil you and make you a casualty of war. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to spoil you and, and, and really make it so that you're of, of sort of no value, right? No, no use. No one's going to give, give what you're saying any credit or, or a fair hearing or whatever because it's, it's, it's just not... It's, it's, it's not palatable. No, I don't want to say it that way. It's not true. It's not accurate. It either... Uh, I think about dispensational truth just as an example. You have Acts 2 brethren, you have Mid-Acts brethren, you have Acts 28 brethren. Okay? I think the Acts 2 brethren under-divide. I think the Acts 28 brethren over-divide. I think there's a moderate view. There's a view that is 
the correct view. Now, in my understanding, that's the mid-Acts view, the idea that the body of Christ started with the salvation of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, right? Or the Acts 13 stripe of the mid-Acts view, which says, no, it started when Paul went on his first apostolic journey there in Acts chapter 13. I don't personally subscribe to the 13 view, but I, I at least understand that view and, and, and can understand that those saints are saying, no, the body of Christ doesn't start until something happens with Paul. It didn't start in Acts 2, and it's not way out here at the end of the book of Acts, right? So the adversary will use anything at his disposal to get us to move off of the line. Now, not just in areas of doctrine, in your marriage, in your family, in the local assembly, um, in um, you know your personal morality, um, all of that stuff. Uh, look at second. Come over Second Corinthians chapter eleven. Look at verse thirteen. So we'll look at a couple more things here, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll call it a night. Look at verse thirteen. For such are for such are false apostles, deceitful. It's here, deceit. False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Satan's devices and tactics are not going to give the impression that they came from him. They're not. They might even be coming from another Bible teacher, or another pastor, or your Bible college, or your seminary, or what, wherever. In fact, I would argue that those are the places where Satan is the most active. Because those are the places where people are going to actually try, theoretically, to understand God and what God is doing today in, 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 as far as his work in the world, right? So it's important to realize that. There are multiple, the idea of, I'm sorry, I lost my spot. No Christian, no Christian would be fooled if Satan came in looking like and acting like and functioning like Satan. So he does everything under the shroud of rightness uh, with, uh, or in, in a shiny way so that you cannot perceive where the deception actually is. Therefore, with respect to Satan's wiles, it ought to be expected that they will present themselves in a cloak of Christianity. Okay? They will appear to be correct. They will appear to be right. They will bear all the appearance of God's own involvement, and hence the truth. However, the, there's a smokescreen here that's designed to mask and provide cover as false information and erroneous doctrines are disseminated. Let me give you an example, okay? I am holding in my hand a King James Bible, okay? I believe this King James Bible is God's word for English-speaking people. I wouldn't change anything about it. There's a position out there about the King James Bible called the Pure Cambridge position. The Pure Cambridge position says that the only printing of a King James Bible to get everything exactly correct in its typesetting, formatting, and, and, and all of the words, and everything spelled right, is a pure Cambridge Bible. A circa, and they identify this specifically as a circa 1900 King James Bible. So in order for me to have the correct King James Bible, I need a Bible that was printed in 1900, according to the pure Cambridge position, 300 years after the King James Bible was first printed. And not only that, the pure Cambridge position was not enunciated until the late 1990s. So it appears on the surface to be a good idea, but what about all those believers that lived before, before the 1990s? What about all those believers that lived before the year 1900 who just had a King James Bible, whatever, whichever one they were fortunate enough to possess for their family, and they read it and believed it? Are we to now say and to think that those believers didn't really have God's true word because they didn't have the correct edition of the King James? To me, that's absurd. There were good folks all the way down through the history of, 
uh, of the last 400 plus years who read and believed their King James Bible to be the Word of God and let it work effectually in them that believed who knew nothing about the modern textual debates. And so when we, when we devise these doctrines that sound good, that sound really enticing, that, you know, we're going to go out, we're going to find the, the, exact, the exact one, what are the implications of that upon people in past generations? This, these are all things that need to be thought through. But the problem is this idea comes in and it sounds good, and folks are like, oh, yeah, 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 that's what we need to do. But is it really a good idea? Does, is that really what preservation is demanding? And what about everybody that lived before 1900 that didn't have access to that edition, or everybody that lived between 1900 and the 1990s who didn't even know about the pure Cambridge position? See, we have to think through what we're doing. But that's the, my point about Wiles. The adversary, if, if, if he can't keep you from a correct understanding of the Bible, what the Bible is and where it's at in your language, he'll work on your understanding, move you into something that is so extreme and deceive you into thinking, yeah, 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 this is where we need to be, but out without thinking through the implications of what it is that's actually being said and what it how it would have impacted people in previous generations. So there's a smoke screen. It's designed to mask and provide a cover as false information and erroneous doctrine is disseminated. Don't get me wrong. Any English-speaking person that had any edition of the King James Bible had God's Word in their language, okay? Whether that's a 1611, whether that's a 1769, whether that's an 1820 publication of it on an American press, it's all God's Word. If we say it's not, and we just need the 1900 Pure Cambridge, circa 1900 Pure Cambridge one, and that now we have to go and correct all these Bibles so that they all cohere with this one, well, no one before the 1990s even thought that. So we have to be careful on these things. And the wiles of the devil are definitely there. Come over to Ephesians 6. Come over to Ephesians 6. And we'll close. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So it's important to notice here that the whole armor of God is what allows us to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay. Now, notice that it says that we're to stand. That's it. It doesn't say we're supposed to advance. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say we're supposed to move forward. It says we're to stand. We're to hold the line. We're not to retreat. We're not to give ground. We're not to back up. But we're also not to be foolhardy and think we're going to, you know, all we are called to do is put on the armor of God and stand and hold our ground. Okay? The word stand here means to make firm, to fix, or to establish. Therefore, the wiles of the devil are designed. What are they designed to do? They're designed to dislodge us. They're designed to knock us off a fixed position. They're designed to cause us to not hold the line. That's what they're designed to do. All right? Look at Ephesians 6, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Okay? Okay? Because we are in a spiritual struggle in verse 12, the only way that we can withstand this, the only way that we can withstand and not be dislodged and not be moved off the line is to put on the armor of God. It's pretty, it's pretty simple when you think about it, what, what this is saying here. So we're to hold the line. We're to withstand. We're not, char we're not called to charge hell with a squirt gun. We're not called to, uh, you know, to, 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 to try to you know, advance and bring in the kingdom, like post-millennial and amillennial theology says. That's, that's all a misunderstanding of God's word rightly divided. All we are told to do is put on the armor of God and hold the line, 
and the nature of the way to are be involved in this, they're not carnal, they're spiritual, and they're mighty through God, as Paul says in in Second Corinthians ten to the pulling down of strongholds. So that's kind of the next piece. Um, I also wanted to mention um, because I'm doing this, uh, my wife recently read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. And I've, I've picked up a copy of this, and I've started reading it. I'm not getting my doctrine from the screw tape letters. The screw tape letters is, a, is an allegory. It's the letters of uh, screw tape to his nephew, Wormwood, about how they're seeking to attack believers and how they are engaging in issues related to spiritual warfare. It's very interesting to read this and think about it in relationship to some of the things that we're that we're talking about. I just wanted to read you one thing. In this, uh, in letter number two in the screw tape letters, um, Wormwood's, the person that Wormwood is trying to uh, influence in spiritual warfare is, has got, has become a Christian, according to this, this particular letter. Uh, and he's, uh, so uh, screw tape says to him the following quote, there is no need to despair. Hundreds of these adult converts have been reclaimed after a brief sojourn in the enemy's camp and are now with us. All the habits of the patient, both mental and mental and bodily, are still in our favor. You know, the reality is, if you get saved today on Wednesday, on Thursday, do you still have a lot of ways that you a lot of coping mechanisms that you've developed in your life for dealing with your life in, in fleshly ways the answer to that is yes okay satan has fiery darts that are uniquely devised for the individual believer to try to move that individual believer off the line to try to dislodge that individual believer from simply girding it up, girding up their loins, and standing for the truth. We're not called to charge. We're not called to advance. We're called to stand and withstand and to put on the armor of God so that we can stand. So I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, we're, we'll hope, we should have our uh, audio-visual issues settled hopefully this coming Sunday. And uh, I'll be moving on with our study on the book of Colossians. So I'm going to send you out here with a little bit of music. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you have a good rest of your week. And hopefully we'll see you Sunday.